Hi everyone, welcome to week one, lecture one. My name is Melissa again, and today we're going to be covering the basics of Egyptian history, art, and archaeology. These are going to be some basic concepts that are going to apply for the entirety of the course and the entirety of Egyptian history. So let's get started. Egyptian history spans over 5,000 years, going from 5,000 BCE to 480. And just to make sure everyone is on the same page, BCE is before the year 1, so the years will actually go backwards from 5,000 to 4,000 and etc. And then from AD and on, the years will continue going forward from 1 to 2 to 3, etc. So the Egyptian civilization is about 7,000 years old. Egyptologists have divided the timeline into periods and then further into dynasties. There are ten total periods that Egyptologists recognize, eight of which are shown below on this chart. We first start with the pre-dynastic Egypt, then we moved to the early dynastic period, the Old Kingdom, the first intermediate period, the Middle Kingdom, the second intermediate period, the New Kingdom, the Third Intermediate Period, the Late Period, and finally the Greco-Roman Period. The intermediate periods are labeled as such because there was usually political turmoil during that time, or the entire civilization may not have unified under one pharaoh. Sometimes Egyptologists call this the Pharaonic Period, but that does not include pre-dynastic Egypt or Greco-Roman Egypt, because technically those two periods were not under a pharaoh which is the Egyptian word for a king. Dynasties are series of rulers that were grouped together by Egyptologists. The first 30 dynasties were originally grouped together by an Egyptian priest from Ptolemaic Egypt called Manetho. Now Manetho may have created this list for a Ptolemaic pharaoh at the time, and this was included in his work called Egyptica. Unfortunately, the lists of pharaohs that have survived are very fragmented, so there are some kings of ancient Egypt that we may know nothing about. It's important to note that not all kings in one dynasty were all blood related, and the dynasties during the intermediate periods may have actually overlapped because different dynasties were ruling different areas of Egypt. The Nile River is the entire life source of ancient Egypt. A civilization would not have been able to survive without the Nile. It is the longest river in Africa, and it crosses over 11 countries. It comes from two sources, the White Nile and the Blue Nile, which both join together at the ancient capital of Khartoum in the Sudan. Everything surrounding the Nile in Egypt is very, very harsh deserts. The majority of both the ancient and modern population live right along the Nile, or in the Delta. This is also where the majority of crops are grown, which in ancient times was watered by the annual flood. The Nile Delta is where the river drains into the Mediterranean Sea. This area is very fertile and green. A very important fact to know is that the Nile flows from the south to the north. Now the ancient Egyptians didn't use south and north. They just followed the flow of the river. So the southern area of ancient Egypt is called Upper Egypt and the northern area of Egypt is called Lower Egypt. This might be a little confusing, so keep that in mind when we move forward. Archaeology in Egypt has a very complicated history. Ever since the turn of the century, Westerners have been fascinated by the ancient Egyptians and the monuments that they left behind. Because of this, Westerners have taken artifacts, statues, and sometimes destroyed entire monuments. These objects that they have taken have been put into Western museums or even private collections. For those who aren't familiar with archaeology, there are two terms that we need to understand first. These are provenance and provenience. They're very similar, but there is one key difference. Provenance is the history of an artifact. This is usually a list of all of the previous owners of that artifact and where it came from originally. Without that, it's kind of hard to know whether or not this object was obtained legally or not. Now provenience is the starting point of an artifact. It usually has to do with its archaeological location, 
the exact pinpointed area where this object was found. The provenance is extremely important to understanding the context of the item and how it related to the ancient person that it once belonged to. The other reason provenance and provenience are so necessary is unfortunately this allows museums and collectors to make sure their item hasn't been stolen or not. For hundreds of years, these quote-unquote archaeologists were more like explorers and they would just take these items without recording any information of where they found it and what context it was found in. This has unfortunately led to some of the most vital objects for the ancient Egyptians and for the modern Egyptians to not actually be currently located in Egypt. Some of their most important artifacts are located in places like the British Museum or the Berlin News Museum. Thank goodness, archaeology has become more organized and sophisticated, but it still was only conducted by Westerners for until very recently. In most recent years, Egyptians have been reclaiming their heritage by both conducting their own excavations as well as requesting and receiving repatriated artifacts, whether they were stolen a couple years ago or a long time ago. It's also good to note that archaeology is very different from the Nile River Valley to the Nile Delta. Excavations in the Nile River Valley usually take place in the wadis or the higher elevation areas off the side of the Nile, usually where the larger tombs are found. This is a very dry archaeology and you're usually sifting through lots of sand and stone. But if you're excavating in the Delta, there's a higher chance that you're actually going to be in a quite wet or damp environment. Luckily, artifacts are most well preserved in extremely hot environments and extremely wet environments, of which the Delta and the desert are both two great examples. Now we're going to talk about some of the core beliefs and traditions of the ancient Egyptians. First, the Egyptians spent the majority of their life preparing for the afterlife. Although you could live to a considerable age in ancient Egypt as long as you survived childhood illness and childbirth if you were a woman, you would pretty much spend your whole life preparing for your burial. The Egyptians believed that the afterlife was exactly like real life, except you'd be in a world with the gods. And because it's the same as real life, you would need to bring anything and everything you could need. This would also include their own bodies. If you could afford it, you would be prepared to be mummified so that your body is preserved and then you would collect certain things that you would need in the afterlife. The Egyptian religion was based in polytheism, which means they believed and worshipped multiple gods. The pantheon of gods is enormous. There are literally hundreds of Egyptian gods. Many of these gods can take a human form, an animal form, or even a mixed form, meaning that they had both animal and human traits. The Egyptians tend to always have a dualistic view of the world. Everything has two sides. This could mean that two things had two complementary sides or two contradicting sides, but both were necessary to create one thought. For example, the annual Nile floods could be seen as this devastating and dangerous thing to both property and people, but at the same time, the water brought life and without it their crops would not grow, so it was still essential to the ancient Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians were a very proud people, and they truly believed that they were the center of the universe. Often they would lump other civilizations into what was called the Nine Enemies. They really saw anyone else besides themselves as the other. This is very prominent in the art style, and I'll be pointing it out throughout the class. One of the most important concepts to understand in both Egyptian life and in Egyptian art is the concept of order over chaos. This combined both the dualistic thoughts and the thoughts of being the other. The Egyptians believed that there was both order and chaos, and you could not have one without the other. They especially believed that their world was order. Everything was the way it was supposed to be, and it was because of their pharaoh. The pharaoh was the keeper of the order over chaos. And then everything outside of the Egyptian world was chaos. This also included the animal world, which we'll be talking about later this week. Here is a list of the standards of Egyptian art. As we'll talk about later this week, these began to be established in the early dynastic period, and they stayed consistent for the majority of Egyptian history. 
So let's go over these terms one by one. The canon of proportions is the most important factor. The Egyptians used this as a way to standardize their imagery. This was also a way to bring order to the natural chaos of life. There was always an 18 square grid that all figures were placed in. Each square was equal to one fist. The grid went also from the heel to the hairline. Any sort of hair or headpiece could be added separately. This grid would help maintain the ratios of length and width for different body parts. If you look at the woman in the image, it's very obvious that people don't stand like this. This is a very uncomfortable position. The feet and the face are in profile, while the shoulders, hips, and arms are full frontal. The Egyptians did this to show every body part in its most perfect form. Because your face is symmetrical, you only need to see one side to understand that it's a face. If you have your face frontal, then you can't see the back of your head. Interestingly, when you look at the feet, you will actually always see an arch and a big toe on both feet. Even though this is not possible as the arches of your feet are on the inside of your feet, this was the way to show an ideal foot. If you looked at a foot from the other direction, the Egyptians believed that you wouldn't be able to understand that it was a foot. The Egyptians also relied on a ground line, which is a line that separated scenes. And registers were the most economical way to construct and organize scenes. Hierarchical scale is the concept that the most important person in the scene is the largest. This would usually be the pharaoh, but in tomb scenes, this would be the tomb owner or owners. Family members would usually be next, and then servants and workmen would be the smallest. You can see all four of these concepts in this image. Equidistance means that the figures in each register will be an equal distance from each other. You can see that even the figures that overlapped are still an equal distance from other groups. Coterminousness means that all figures in each register will be geometrically identical and in a repetitive pattern. The figures are almost used as a pattern because they are practically identical and then repeat throughout the register. Isocephaly means that the heads are always placed at the same height within the register, with the exception of hierarchical scale. And finally, fixity is when each character is fixed to the register or ground line. You can see that their feet never leave that ground line. All in all, the Egyptians always wanted symmetry or balance. They believed that this balance helped make the world beautiful and in the correct order. This image shows the gods Horus and Seth tying a lotus and papyrus plant together. This is called a Sematawi sign and is usually used to signify the uniting of Upper and Lower Egypt. This is an example of approximate symmetry because the characters are different but they are also in the same position. There are other examples of the Sematawi sign with the god Happy on either side, which would be an example of bilateral symmetry. While some may see Egyptian art as this rigid or harsh form, it can be very beautiful and whimsical at times. So, let's dive into the first two periods of Egyptian art, the pre-dynastic and early dynastic eras. Please keep this knowledge from this lecture in mind throughout the course. I will continue to use a lot of this vocabulary in the future. Thanks, and have a great day.